So Julio Frank, uh, Dr. Julio Frank, um, is a fourth generation physician. Uh, he's the sixth president of the University of Miami. He's a professor at the Leonard Miller School of Medicine. He was the dean of Medi uh, public health at um, in, uh, at the Howard T. Shen in Harvard. And um, he actually is also a professor at the Harvard School of uh, Business. Uh, I met Julio when he was the Minister of Health in Mexico. And there's moments in your life that you identify a leader, a global health leader, a global leader by itself. And I was super impressed with him. I actually, it's a shame for our global public health that he's not the WHO director. I hope he becomes the next president of Mexico. So, um, or Mexico, so be correct. Uh, he's, uh, he's the, he actually created something spectacular, which the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, which I visited with him and I was very proud of his work. Um, his degree, his awards are, I can spend 10, 10 hours actually, or 10 days talking about it, Dr. Julio Frank, but um, he, um, one of the things that he, he's in the, some of the biggest accolades worldwide he has received. So um, Julio is with us and I'm, I'm very proud of that. I just want to remind everybody to fill the survey from the Oak Ridge and um, survey that they presented to you because it's going to become into our research agenda. So Dr. Frank, technically we have uh, 40 minutes and I will, I, I will ask you to take uh, 15 minutes of, of your time and then we will answer QAs. And when Dr. Chaya joins seen. I will introduce him and we will do the same. Very good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Juxel. You're very, very kind. Uh, your, your, your words are uh, really humble me and I am proud to be your friend for now many, many years and have shared a lot of very interesting episodes in, in, in our joint quest for better health around the world. Um, I, uh, I think we are at a very special moment in the education of the health of health professionals broadly and particularly medical education, which is uh, the, the topic of this session. But, but uh, we are at, a, at, a, at an incredible juncture right now because we were uh, in a decade of a lot of innovation in, in education in general, and then the pandemic hit. And although the pandemic didn't initiate a lot of those changes, it has certainly accelerated them. And I think coming out of the pandemic, where most universities around the world and institutions of higher education, educating doctors and other health professionals and other people have had to adapt to unprecedented circumstances, that acceleration of change, I think, creates an opportunity uh, not to go back to the old normal. That, I think, would be unacceptable, but to build not just a new normal, but a better normal. I think we, we have a platform for, for action. Um, you know, um, a little bit more than 10 years ago in 2010, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report, which as most of you I'm sure know, was the report published in 1910 that really gave shape to medical education, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, using, you know, stating that medical education should be based in universities, should be based in, on science. A um, hundred years later in 2010, when I was dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, I had the honor of co-chairing along with my colleague Lincoln Chen, uh, a, an international commission on the education of health professionals for the 21st century. That was the name of the commission. We published our report in The Lancet in December of 2010. And that report um, has been a very, very influential. Um, and it has, um, you know, over the 10, these 10 years, uh, generated a lot of citations. But I wanted just to share some of the, uh, what, what's happened in, in this decade. I do think 
even before the pandemic, we were at the threshold of a revolution in education in general, but particularly in medical education, which is our focus. And that, that, that revolution is being um, driven by three main factors. First of all, we've had unprecedented advances in the learning science. We understand better than ever how humans in general and adults, which is the population we educate in universities, learn. So great advances in learning sciences. Secondly, we have had huge advances in technology. For whatever reason, education was one of the few fields that did not experience an, a technological revolution in the 20th century compared with healthcare. You know, we, we really entered the 21st century basically with the same tools we had. The Blackboard, even PowerPoint, is nothing more but another way of, of, of projecting the printed word. Someone has said that the last big technological revolution had been the invention of the, of the printing press by Gutenberg. Well, that revolution is happening now in technology through high quality online technologies, through a mixed and, 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 uh, and virtual reality, through highly sophisticated elements of uh, simulation. We're in the middle of a technological, uh, of technological advances in education, applied to education. And then the third force driving change, I, I think the most meaningful one, in addition to advances in science and in technology, is that our students are graduating into the most dynamic labor market in history. While students are at medical school, new professions are being created in the health field, and the existing professions are being transformed by some of those technological advances they are not just changing education, but they're also changing healthcare. So almost by definition, we cannot educate our students for everything they're going to need while they're at the university. We need to switch the model. And that was um, when we did the, the Lancet report, we made a, a series of proposals for a new educational strategy with two main dimensions, the instructional dimension and the institutional dimension. And the instructional dimension refers, first of all, to a strategic shift. Uh, so far, the prevailing model in higher education has been one of a closed system, where you have an input, that's admissions. You have a throughput, which is the educational process while you're in, in, at medical school. And then you have an output, which is called graduation. And maybe you do postgraduate medical education, but you're basically out into the real world. It's a closed system. Um, we need to change this for an open architecture because now students are graduating into this dynamic labor market and, I, and, 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 and career plasticity is going to be the, 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 the name of the game in the future. And I can say a little bit more about that. The other big strategic shift then, which follows from the first one, is that instead of a, an education model where we front load the content and the costs of education, so, you know, at college, you front load on those four years. At medical education, you front load cost and content. We really need to, to move to uh, what I call education for life. Education that, that lasts your entire career cycle. And we need to redesign universities to deliver that. And this is much more than traditional continuing medical education that we've used mostly for relicensure purposes in medicine. It really is about changing the content of your capabilities to match the dynamics of what's happening in the workplace, which is in the health system. And, and, and that's the other big strategic shift. We need to articulate the educational system and the healthcare system in a much, much better way. Uh, the Lancet report goes into huge details into this. I'm not we this is just meant to be a, 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 a summary of, of what I think are the main trends. And I would just finish by saying on the inst instructional side, first of all, we need to really shift the focus from what, uh, from what we've had now, which is basically measuring the amount of effort you put into the education by measuring credit hours and the time you spend in a classroom to uh, an outcome-based approach. People call this typically competency-based approach. I like to, to, to talk of capabilities because some of these competencies are complex cognitive processes. But competency-based education is, is the name of the future. 
very importantly, we, uh, we need to move into interprofessional education. The reality in the workforce is teamwork in healthcare. Healthcare is too complex, and yet we still have educational institutions very much siloed with medical education, nursing education, dental education, uh, other health professionals in silos. And that's not preparing students for the reality of teamwork. So interprofessional education is an absolute uh, need, I think, in this in this day and age. And learning to work as a teacher or, or capabilities that we need to develop. And then finally, I think we need to move into a model uh, of what I call engaged learning, where we use uh, uh, different modalities of delivery uh, in a blended format. In the Lancet report, we recognize three levels of learning. The most basic learning we call informative learning. And that's, as the name implies, about the transmission of factual foundational information. Very important part of education. And what that produces is an expert. But when we're talking about medical education, that's not enough. You need to move from informative now to include also, these are not alternative, these are uh, complementary, from informative to formative learning. And there, it's about socializing students into the values of a profession. So rather than producing experts, you produce professionals. A professional is an expert who's been socialized into an ethic of service. And that's still not enough. We need to go to transformative learning, from informative to formative to transformative. And there, what you are producing is change agents. Because transformative learning is about developing competencies or capabilities in leadership, where you learn to master not just the technical content, but also the institutional and systemic context, not just content, but context of your practice. These are some of the big ideas. They're being translated here at the University of Miami. We just launched a, something we call the Next Gen MD curriculum based on a lot of these principles. And, and, and we just admitted the first class last year in the middle of the pandemic. It's an exciting new approach. We're not the only medical school and we're actually planning for November of 2022, a major uh, global conference on medical education. This is the, the instructional, and I will just say one thing about institutional. We need to leverage this moment of technological change to really build global consortia of, 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 of uh, medical schools and other institutions, because there's no way that each of the uh, countries in the world can develop their own capabilities to, 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 fully, to fully realize this opportunity uh, that we have before us. Well, I, I really appreciate your words, uh, Dr. Frank. It's an honor to be sharing the screen with you. Uh, it's an honor to introduce now Stephen Shaya. Um, one thing that they have in common is that they are great fathers, and I had to bring that up because uh, both of them, I, I remember I was in Dr. Frank's office the other day, and, and he says, well, I only take phone calls from my my children, my son, and the son was calling. So that's how and he was going to a board meeting. So that's that tells you about their heart. Again, I want to remind everybody to fill the survey. Um, by the way, Dr. Frank, there's a uh, alum from the University of Miami watching you. She's she's very proud of you. So uh, just uh, you can say hello to her. So, Dr. Shaya, one of the things that impressed me when I met him is that he's a executive, executive servant leader that tells you a lot about him. He's, uh, he has one of the largest um, medical healthcare, global healthcare corporations related to medical device. He's, um, he's, uh, he has received multiple, multiple awards. He went to Wayne State University and, uh, and he did his uh, medical degree the, degree as well there. Uh, he's the managing director of ACA Holdings, AKKA Holdings. You have to look at their website. They are doing a lot of great work. Um, he has received 
numerous awards as well. Uh, he also has received the U.S. Congressional com uh, Commendation. He's the American Diabetes Father of the Year. He has the, from the UN, and we were talking with uh, Dr. Frank, he was the Global Medical Innovation Award by the UN. Um, one, the way I met him was, uh, he was one of the supporters of the International Global uh, Healthcare and Innovation Conference by the Vatican. So he's uh, also a true leader, and I just wanted him to share some of his thoughts, not only about medical and health education globally, but some of the challenges that we have. And um, Dr. Chaya, it's 11.35, so you have uh, 10 minutes, uh, 12 minutes, I will say, and, and then we can go for QA. But thank you, Dr. Chaya, for being here. Well, thank you, Dr. Garcia, and um, uh, and thank you uh, 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 for this opportunity and, and sending blessings and positive energy to everyone that's participating today. Um, just a, a little bit briefly about my background. As Dr. Garcia said, I'm a family practice physician. I've done about 100 deliveries of babies in my career. My family are Iraqi Christian. Uh, we come from a very poor enclave in Iraq. And my grandmother, uh, she had 11 children. When number 11 was in utero, um, her husband uh, uh, prematurely passed away from an accident. So she raised 11 children on her own. Um, and um, she was a midwife. She delivered thousands of babies. She was one of the happiest people that I've ever met in my life. Um, and a, a true testament to, to being rich in family, rich in spirit, rich where it mattered, um, and just a, a very strong woman, a very strong leader. And even in the, the, the poorest areas, they were in a very small village, so there weren't hospitals there. Uh, she was someone um, who uh, always found a way to help people, whether they had a way to pay her or not. So we come from very much a, a family of, of service, and I think my grandmother really uh, gave us the, the um, you know, she was really set this in our DNA to, to, you know, that we were servant leaders and we were there to give back. And every time I did a delivery of a baby, I always thought how my grandmother did this in, in you know, didn't have a hospital, didn't have nurses, didn't have equipment, didn't have supplies, but she delivered thousands of babies and, and and, and I can't tell you every day um, I run into people that my grandmother delivered. Um, so it was, uh, was, it was it's truly an honor that she was my grandmother. Um, so that always left something in uh, my family in that how much joy you could get from providing care to people, especially kind of in remote, rural, uh, undeveloped areas. And our company uh, today uh, runs the gamut from medical distribution to specialty distribution. But one of the real um, things that my father was very excited about was um, um, technology and how technology could provide access to care globally. So we started from scratch 12 years ago and we built a uh, telemedicine company, which if you know my father was pretty pretty comical because he, um, he couldn't turn his computer on and off, but he was determined that we were going to develop a, 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 te a technology platform that could provide care to people around the globe. And as always, uh, with more will than skill, he was correct. So what we've been able to do is take technology and really uh, provide access to care in many, many places, both domestically and globally, uh, to people that never had access to care before. And it was not just the technology. But there were, we also put an innovative business model behind it. So in Pakistan, we took care of um, literally um, millions of patients in areas that didn't have electricity, in areas um, that didn't have even infrastructure, um, didn't have internet. And by using um, solar panels to provide energy, by using a satellite to provide connectivity, and we developed in a partnership with Commonwealth Fund out of the UK, a very innovative business model, no margin, no mission, where we could literally take care of large population at a fraction of the cost that they were spending. And that enabled us 
um, to provide access to care. And that unique situation really taught me what opportunities there could be. Um, that was um, uh, about four years ago that we had started that project. Um, and now with global Wi-Fi and with connectivity, you know, everyone, you know, more people have phones in this world than have clean water, unfortunately. I think the opportunities are tremendous for us to, to connect with people um, and to provide access to care and provide education. You know, one thing that my father always used to say, and he died last November, but he always used to say that, you know, when people could reach their health potential, they could reach their human potential. And that's why he felt my family and I were called to get into healthcare is that we um, really, if we could help people, you know, achieve that, 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 you know, health potential, that it was limitless what hopefully they could do. And a big part of that is the health literacy. And part of the programs that we've done around the world is educating um, key folks, particularly mothers of children, about uh, particular disease conditions like diabetes, for example, prenatal care. And by better educating them, um, you know, we've been able to show there's better outcomes, and by better getting better outcomes, it has a downstream as a force multiplier impact throughout society. So we really have believed that focusing on mothers and children globally um, and leveraging technology, leveraging innovation, um, leveraging this new global connectivity is going to provide tremendous opportunities. But let me also say it's not just these global initiatives. Uh, I'll take another example here locally. Um, in uh, Los Angeles, in a very urban part of Los Angeles, what? 40% um, um, of the population did not see a primary care physician in 12 months. 17% didn't see any healthcare professional. But we were able to put um, a technology solution in community centers, in a church, a synagogue, um, a YMCA, you know, places where people congregate and get together and provide access uh, to health professionals, provide access to education, and that um, was able to move the needle on on folks. Of course, seeing a primary care physician or seeing any healthcare um, professional um, will not only provide care but provide education that's much needed uh, for the long-term wellness of of folks. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, um, you know, for innovation, for creativity. And I just want to just step back with the Pakistan really quickly. You know, our world is very bitterly divided, you know, religiously, politically, socioeconomically. There's the sensitivities with the pandemic are amplified in so many places and in, in many divisions. But I got to tell you firsthand, providing access to care uh, to people, it, it built bridges that you can't even imagine. It built bridges that, I mean, I mean, it did more to move the needle than any arms you would, you know, make or any political thing. Just showing people you care, you know, and 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 you know, putting you know humanity into our you know humankind. I, I think it, it was really something that really moved me. And I think there's a lot of those opportunities. And I um, I applaud the University of Miami and everything you're uh, doing, uh, Julio, for educating folks on, on the opportunities. It's really, really inspiring. I, I really thank you, Dr. Shaya, because that shows us the balance between uh, high research institutions like University of Miami uh, versus uh, low research locations. Uh, it reminds me also when you talk about the midwives. Uh, I went to Afghanistan couple of times and uh, dealing with the Ravi Bolki Hospital of Women and Children. And uh, everything was to improve the, how they were doing the C-sections and the mortality rate that they have, which was over 70% of women that have C-sections. So there was the balance in between education, public health, primary care and prevention. So I really appreciate that. I, I remember going with uh, Dr. Frank to Mexico and uh, Mexico, uh, and he actually uh, showed me a telemedicine project that they have. They actually were taking care of people virtually and in the um, prison system, and it was interesting because we had, um, if 
correct me, Julio, if I'm wrong, but uh, I think it was the ambassador of Canada or the diplomat from Canada that was diagnosed with diabetes in that exact moment using the technology that uh, Mexico had for telemedicine. But I, I would open to questions. I, I think I am very excited uh, about the vision. I like that uh, Dr. Frank brought the, the, the part from the Lancet and all the work that ha have done. And Dr. Shaya, you make it very real talking about deliveries and your grandmother. As a matter of fact, if I recall, your grandmother has a quote from Mother Teresa that I, I will ask people to to search that, but um, I will open to questions. And um, and I also want to thank Katie, uh, because honestly, it doesn't matter my IQ or how many degrees I have, I only can turn on and off the computer and Katie actually allowed me to come here. So I, I just want to thank Katie for that. So if there's any questions, uh, I'm, I'm open to, to questions, please. Uh, I'm supposed to pick up the right. Um, let me see. Um, let me just to the. Sorry, guys. I really apologize. Um, okay, so there's a question. These are wonderful examples of single solutions for a specific health gap. Is there a system model solution? How can preparation of a global health workforce be a scale? That's the first question. Uh, so is that? It's uh, open to both of you. Uh, maybe Dr. Frank, I could. Uh, I'll give my first uh, first uh, foray into it. Um, one of the areas that uh, my family and I are really focused, uh, and I give you a little bit of background uh, because of my grandmother and some of these other initiatives, is really um, around global health. I think the opportunities for um, advancement, especially with global wi-fi and and you know many people around the world having um cell phones in fact in places like kenya they do most of the banking from their cell phones um so it's really um it, you know those technologies those opportunities are really advancing um i think to be successful in any of these initiatives it's not one group it's not one silo it's not one swim lane one of the things that we've done is that we um, have a partnership with the Cura Foundation and the Vatican. Um, of course, the Vatican has uh, numerous challenges, uh, but uh, nobody houses, clothes, feeds, educates, or provides more healthcare globally uh, than the Catholic Church. So in a partnership with the Cura Foundation, um, we have put together uh, you know, mechanisms and programs where we can advance some of these global health initiatives and uh, hopefully take these innovations and leverage some of the um, global channels of the uh, of the Catholic Church. And and I think it, it, it the technology, the innovations are one thing, but really in healthcare, innovation is integration. That's innovation. And how do you go to these different places around the world and bring all the key stakeholders together? And um, and uh, I think one of the challenges is that so many people are trying these new great innovative things but it's hard to bring everyone you know together the key folks together and get alignment and and so we're looking for some of those global type partnerships and opportunities and i think when you're able to do that when you're able to get alignment that you know whatever changes you make are, are more sustainable um the other thing i just wanted to add on that is that you know whether it's telehealth video conferencing mobile apps sensors we're all going to be in a connected health environment moving forward. So I don't think it's telemedicine or telehealth. I think, to, and Dr. Frank's already, you know, ahead of this with the medical education. I think it's going to be healthcare, and you know, technology is here to stay, and it's going to continue to play a bigger, bigger role. And I think the pandemic's only accelerated that whole process. Thank you, Dr. Shaya. I, I, I would like to hear your comments about that, uh, Dr. Frank. But I have a specific question that came for you related to the certifications globally for medical education and other healthcare uh, fields. Uh, I know you're an expert in terms of uh, licensure, certification, and other uh, credentialing, if you can comment on that as well. So if the question is... The, the question was for Dr. Frank. Oh, uh, please, yeah, that's, that's a good. <laughs> 
So, you know, the, the, the reason <clears throat> that in, in that Lancet report of 2010 and now in the current, uh, we're doing a, an update of that uh, after the pandemic. The, the reason we, we talk about two dimensions, instructional and institutional, is because the institutional setting is super important. One of the elements of the of, of, of institutions is exactly certification constraints and, 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 and accreditation constraints. And, and I do think, I, I think we need, uh, you know, in response to the previous question also, to leverage the technological opportunities to really build a, a mindset of consortia. There's no way then that, you know, the, whatever it is now, 192 independent sovereign member states of the United Nations, each of them by themselves can produce their own full complement of health professionals that are needed to, to meet the needs of their respective populations. We have to leverage that in, 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 a, in a much more productive way than what we do now. Right now, we have a global marketplace, labor marketplace, where basically rich countries, um, in, in, you know, induce or, or recruit from developing countries. This is particularly dramatic in nursing, but also, I mean, in the United States, one quarter of the doctors practicing in the United States were born outside of the United States and were educated outside. And so what you have there is a massive transfer of human capital from poor countries to rich countries. The poor countries typically will subsidize that medical and nursing education. And then it's the rich countries that then profit or, or benefit from, from those investments that are done by poor countries. We need a framework to, to first of all, to I, I'm all in favor of migration and, and I'm an example of a migrant. But we need to do that in a way that compensates the sending countries for the investments they have done uh, uh, in, in their own workforce. Secondly, and probably more important even, is what Dr. Shaya was, was alluding to. It's leveraging the technology we have today to really build connections across the globe and share resources, share educational resources, and, 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 and really be able to scale up there's what we have in terms of the health workforce is two types of imbalances. We have a quantitative imbalance. You have places in the world where there are not enough doctors and nurses and community health workers. You have places where there are, where you have the paradoxical coexistence of unemployed doctors, but they're living in cities, maybe driving a taxi, while you have communities in the same country without doctors. So that, that is a horrible paradox, but that's because the conditions for practice in a rural remote area are not there. So some people who go through medical school prefer actually to stay in the city, even if they cannot work in their profession, rather than go to where they're most uh, required. And, and, and then lastly, we have qualitative um, imbalances where the set of skills that, they, that are brought to bear are not the ones that are needed. We need much more emphasis on primary care. We need much more emphasis on team-based work. Uh, we need more competency around the use of some of these technologies. So I think this is a good time to, to, to learn from the pandemic. The pandemic forced everyone around the world to embrace remote learning technologies. But what we did during the pandemic was just an emergency measure. That's not what we should, what should become the new normal or the better normal. We need to invest in some of those technologies to achieve huge efficiency gains, but where you could actually build global teams where you know people in remote villages are connected to the cities where you may have some of those doctors who don't want to migrate, but you have sufficiently well-trained community health workers that they can become part of the team. And in fact, we advocate not just for interprofessional but transprofessional education that brings the non-professional element of the workforce, like community health workers, into that idea of teams. And then, you know, for very, very elaborate processes, like diagnostic processes, which increasingly are being, uh, you, you, you know, we're using artificial intelligence for image interpretation for a, a lot of diagnostic, you can actually create global hubs where you will do a lot of that and you don't need each country to be to trying to invest on, on some of those platforms, which are 
very expensive and and then you know not investing in what's really needed which is a, 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 a robust primary care uh, uh, setting with a global referral network so what we need is yeah national and local health systems but that are interconnected into a global resource pool both of educational material and open i'm a strong believer in open educational resources but also in terms of of the actual healthcare uh, platforms using uh, what we now have we we have a connected world we need to mobilize that connectivity in favor of education and of healthcare thank you dr frank i actually i have a very interesting question that came here but i only have four minutes i'm just going to ponder the question and i i would ask all the viewers to actually follow dr shaya and dr frank and the university of miami and Ica holdings on their Twitter accounts and LinkedIn because uh, you can ask them questions directly. The, the question actually is, the world has the largest refugee population in history. How can a healthcare workforce be created from within the, the population? And I think, uh, Julio, uh, I, I know you work big time with this. I remember in my office from El Paso and your team, we deal with that significantly. So I only have four minutes, but if one minute for each one of you, but starting with Julio and then Dr. Shaya. I mean, on this particular issue of, of, uh, of, of refugees? Yes. Or, or more, you know, it is an example of, uh, of, of the fact that we do live in a, in a connected world. Look, we're all migrants and we're all refugees in one way or another. I mean, Dr. Shaya, I'm sure can, from what I just heard, my grandparents were refugees. You know, we all have those histories. We need to build an ethos of, of universal, you know, we talk about universal health coverage. That is a fundamental human right of every person, irrespective of their migratory or refugee status. And it is it, it requires the collective will of all nations to provide adequate standards of care of people irrespective of where they are located we have the resources and we have the uh, and, 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 and we have the technology that's required and the financial resources and the technology we're lacking the political will to treat everyone in this world as as human beings the pandemic is a an example and a reminder of the downside of being so interconnected let's bring together the bright side of interconnectedness. Let's never again have a situation like we're having with access to vaccines. It's a shameful spectacle to see rich countries where there's an excess of vaccines that some of their people, because they're misinformed, are rejecting and have at the same time millions or billions of people who desperately need a vaccine and don't have access to that. I think this should be a wake up call for everyone. That's an unacceptable state of affairs and and we need the political will to 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 change that reality well said um, dr frank um dr chad you have one minute one minute so, i just heard uh, i just want to echo dr frank the, the the health inequities around the world that show up with vaccines and many other things i could not agree with him more in healthcare is an absolute right not a privilege so we should never take it for granted it's not a nice to have everyone must have it uh otherwise we all we all suffer um, let me just say, this is the Global Action Summit. Um, I, I think one of the opportunities leveraging technology, I would love to throw out an idea. One day a month, every healthcare professional in a rich country, United States or other, spend one day just virtually providing education or care, whether it's to refugees or people anywhere around the world. I think if we make service a bigger part of, of, of you know, the delivery of healthcare, I mean, we all want to heal, but it shouldn't just be because someone has insurance, you know, it should be, you know, and I think we have to, as a society, make a commitment, as Dr. Frank said, that we are going to help bridge some of these inequities. We actually have a project going on in the northern part of Iraq, where we have telemedicine uh, going in the northern part of Iraq, and these folks literally lost everything, refugees from around the world. So um, I, I think it's a big idea. That the, technology is an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility. And we should leverage that and everyone should give back. It doesn't matter if it's one hour or five hours or one day or 
whatever. And, and I think technology now takes away that excuse is I'm going to go away and do a medical mission or do this. You can do it, you know, find opportunities leveraging technology. So that's, that's uh, something. I, I really, I really want to thank you, both of you. This was uh, an amazing opportunity for learning for me and for the people that uh, were listening and watching. I, I really exhort people not only to fill the survey, but also to go and check uh, Dr. Frank's work at the University of Miami and Dr. Ashaya's work with AK Holdings. They are doing a lot of global health. And, and one last thing, and it's not part of my, my speech, but uh, Dr. Ashaya just elicited that on me. I, I still working virtually to try to support and protect the midwives in Afghanistan. Um, it was painful for me to see the suffering that they were going and how they had to uh, big exodus to other countries in the region. So keep that in mind. And I really want to thank you, everybody that were here and Dr. Frank, Dr. Chaya, I owe you big time for the opportunity that you gave me today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.